hospital? Yeah, it, uh, they started in 1960. You know, they, they started to lay the foundation. They were going to build it that summer. But then one of the stores or the Hudson Bay House or the store at Albany burned down. So they had to stop work on the church and send the carpenters up to Rupert to Albany to build this building that had burned. I think it was the store. So that was the, what the carpenters were doing all that summer. They didn't do any work on this till later on. But it was finished in 1864, this building here. And all the lumber in the lock came from Sopkin Island. And they had big spikes in the logs, you know, going right through, <laughs> and then this way too. Seems to be okay, the roof, you know, maybe it needs replacing. The tin, some of the tin was replaced. And they replaced some of the logs, especially down the bottom, and some in the, in the walls. And the tower was fixed up and they get a big, it's sitting on a cement foundation. So it cannot sink down any further. But in the beginning, <clears throat> there was a three foot wall, limestone wall, that the church sits on. You can't see it today because it's underground. You know, the, the ground has got clay on it. And when you put something, it just seems to sink. That's what happened to that. So you can just see the top of the three foot wall now, if you go there and look. And, you know. But it was above ground three feet. So the weight of the church yeah, has pushed this, the foundation down into the ground. And the, these holes along the side of the, the building, especially on the outside, along the foundation, also along underneath the pews, they think one time that was just to keep the logs from rotting underneath the floor. The wind would blow through there, you know. And if they were wet, the wind during the summertime would dry it out. And they also found uh, shavings there underneath the floor. And they think the carpenters put the shavings there as insulation. But the story they give the tourists is to make a good story. <laughs> Let the water come in the spring and let it, let it flow out again. Oh. So it wouldn't stay in there. So that's what the, the tourists hear. But whether he actually, I guess it must have too, you know. It actually, the water came in and they flowed out again. Mm -hmm. They just pulled the plugs out, you know. Just like the floating church. Yeah, that's the old story. Yeah. But that's the it did float away, but there was no walls on it. Mm -hmm. It's just, it was sitting on the foundation, you see. And just the foundation itself was was uh, nailed, but not onto the sleepers, not onto the, you know, the footings. Mm -hmm. So when the water rose, it lifted the whole thing up, and it floated out this way towards Archie, Hester's house and Clarence's house, somewhere, because there was, o there was open fields there one time, you know? It was not grown up as it is today. But there was a small church there, uh, say 20 years before or maybe 40 years before that the Methodists had used they built a small church they were the first Christian ministers to come here was the, what they called the Methodists like George Barnley came this way through to Miskamin I guess from Montreal there or North Bay whatever and he came here to teach the Hudson Bay kids as a tutor kids, and also acted as a chaplain, he used to mention that. But because he didn't have a house of his own not right away, he lived, they gave him a room in the Hudson Bay and they fed him there with his wife. And it was during then he, was, he talked about having a residential school here. He had plans already and I have the book on his journal, you know saying what he's, that there should be here a residential school for kids, but Hudson Bay didn't like that idea <clears throat> because you would keep the families here instead of being in the bush and hunting fur so that they could uh, continue their trade. They didn't like that idea. But uh, Barnley did, and they also didn't like them working on Sunday. Maybe to put this in context, if you go right back to the earliest days of the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, in 1686, 13 years after they'd been in Moose Factory, 
there was this overland expedition which captured Moose Factory. And at that time, there was uh, a European woman staying in James Bay. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there was a chaplain working for the Hudson's Bay Company. And because of this military raid, the Hudson's Bay Company decided, number one, it was unsafe for women and that it should just be men that were sent out, and number two, it was not safe for uh, clergymen as well. The Hudson's Bay Company basically, uh, after this early experience that they'd had in 1686, was content to keep missionaries out, keep missionary influence out, so that there was no uh, competing ideas. So that really set the tone for the next uh, 150 years or so. Now in the early years of the uh, 19th century, even though the Hudson's Bay Company had forbidden their servants, their employees, to have relationships with uh, Indian women, they started to recognize that there were a number of children of mixed ancestry living around the posts. And as part of that, they, they opened up schools at the major posts, Moose Factory, Fort Albany, and uh, Fort George. These schools were specifically for these children of mixed ancestry living at the posts year-round. And the idea was that they would go to school for a few years, learn a little bit of reading and uh, writing, arithmetic, and religion. And at the end of this period of time, they would have some of the skills of, um, that they would need to work for the Hudson's Bay Company. At the same time that these schools were open, specifically for the uh, servants' children, there was an invitation to the children of the Indian chief, the, the uh, preeminent Indian for each of the areas that their children could go have a special invitation to attend these schools. And this marked a big change.